All right, hopefully everybody's had a chance to uh, get everything caught up. Uh, Mr. Batson, where'd Joe go? Joe Batson. Joe Batson. All right, I'll get to him in a minute. All right, so all we have left to hand out this month are shingles. Uh, are my in-scale guys here? I know David Bryan's not here, Speed's not here. Anybody else in in-scale? I'll tell you what, since they're not here, I want to make sure he gets plenty of extras. So I want to give him two, two full sheets. All right, the way these shingles are going to work is by what I've been able to do so far, and I'll hold up a set of G scale ones to give you an idea. Actually, no, I won't because it's not a that's not a full count. The HO shingles are all three tab asphalt, and they're in kind of a neutral gray color. This way, if your roof wants needs to be green, you can make it green. If it's brown, you can make it brown. But if I cut it in brown and you need it in green, you're kind of hosed. So I'm doing these in uh, in kind of a neutral gray. These are cut in newsprint, kind of a thicker newsprint. Uh, they lay down real nice. Uh, the, the tape that we're going to use to put these things down is the best way, hands down, to put down a roof. This works on shingles. It works on the sheet metal. It really makes life really handy. Now, by my math and going through it with the computer, one sheet of this should get you all the way up one side of your roof. I will give you two and I will give you a few extras because and there's a couple of extras it should take like 39 rows or 38 rows and there's one or two extras on each one of these plus I'm going to give you some extra anyway just in case because if you get a little thin in a spot or something and you don't get a row set in there just right you're probably going to be a little bit short and I don't want you being shorter than you get extra. so we're going to hand all this out here in a second uh, yeah two sheets per and then we'll give some extras in, so and before we get rolling too much further, does anybody else want to roll a tape? Five bucks a roll. This, this is An so investment much well made. Yeah, this stuff is so much easier than putting it down with glue. Would you, would you put in the whistle where the source is for this tape in case we need more? Uh, certainly. Amazon.com. And it's on Prime. What's it called? Uh, it's made by 3M. 3M ATG Adhesive Transfer Tape 987. The problem is you have to buy it by a case box of a dozen. So... Did I give you change? Oh, that's your one. I think that my one that I bought were bigger than this. Yeah, it depends on who you get them from. You can buy these through Uline. They make a, a roll of this stuff. Yeah. One. And... Uh, Uline sells this as well. I have not tried theirs yet. It's an inch tall instead of this half inch roll like this. And I don't know from a linear footage for what Uline wants for it if it's more cost effective than this or not. But it's also a three mil thick type of transfer tape. So this works out real well. All right. Is Jeff making the rounds? Uh, Batson's back. Where's my G scale? Is so he not here? No. 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 Ah. You mean I made an extra trip the other night, last night, to cut get shingle material and he doesn't show up? Well, I'm going to get it to him, so. <laughs> Give you an idea how bad the G scale ones were to cut them the same length. The way those rows are cut, it should stretch all the way across your roof and have a tab or two over on either end. To do it in G scale, this is about maybe a little over half of a row so where you guys got two he got like eight eight sheets of this stuff so yeah it's uh, it's fun uh, mr. Batson I was just looking at the roofing material that I cut for yours and when I'm cutting these are cutting two layers deep the second one did not cut through real good 
So I will give you a choice. If you want to take that one home and just do a linear cut down the long way, they'll pop out of there, but you'll have to cut them. If you don't want to, I'll cut you another sheet and I'll bring it next month. <laughs> However you want to play. Sorry about that. I didn't, didn't notice it until just now. Yeah, yeah, you dropped two sheets in, and I did that with everybody's, and it worked just fine. I don't know why it didn't work on that one. <laughs> yeah, that Murphy's Law thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, right there, something with friends. Right there, they, they, they used to have a boy that showed Brand train. Brand is train. He's definitely one of your can't hear the other. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't, I don't even roll a tape. I've got to. I mean, when the trains come, you used to have to say train four or six at this time. All right. Before we get started on the roofing, we're going to start working on the bay window. I'd mentioned last month about getting an emery board. If you bought just a generic one or swipe one from the wife, you're going to want to use the coarse side of the board. If you went down to Sally's where you can get them by various grits, you're going to want about a hundred grit side on your sandpaper or whatever the most coarsest one you have. The more coarse the sandpaper, the faster this is going to go. And what you're going to want are these three pieces. This is the front of the bay window here. And then you have two wings here and here, like that. We're going to work on these two pieces right here, okay? What you're going to want to do, I lay my emery board flat on the, on, the, on the table. I hold on to this, and you're going to be real careful about it because these wings are a little weak, especially if you're working it in scale. I put my pinky behind it and my thumb behind it, and then I put my two then I put finger and finger and support it on both sides, and then I hold it at an approximate angle. You're not trying to get perfection here. If you do, then you need to go build a jig and get really fancy with it. This isn't this isn't rocket science. You don't have to be perfect with it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, what I do in that, and I, I know I've preached before, don't just sand back and forth. But in this case, you kind of have to sand back and forth. What you're going to have to be careful is to observe your sanding when you, after you've made a few passes with it, you're going to want to lift it up and look at it. And what you're going to find is one end or the other, you've pushed on it harder and you've sanded further on that end. And if that's indeed the case, flip it back over again, put more pressure on the end that you didn't sand enough on and make a few more back and forth passes. This is why I always recommend not sanding back and forth, okay? Once you get an angle on here that looks about like it's 45 degrees, it doesn't have to be perfect, okay? The whole idea is that you can take it then and put it up against the central window that I held up first, and it should then sit at a wee bit of an angle so that when we put it onto the depot, it would go on something like this. And you're going to have to put an angle on both edges of this piece. Both edges? Both edges. So the inside edge right now is straight. Okay? So when you get done, the inside edges should lean in a little bit, a little bit on both sides. Okay? That will allow the board to set up against the edge of the depot at a little bit of an angle and then reach the front portion of the operator's window here at another angle. Okay? You sand the other one? You can. It, you don't have to, but it's it's easier just to sand the, the two oh, side pieces. Oh, this one. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Certainly won't hurt. As long as you meet, as long as that corner meets in a way that the thing is if you sand both of them, what you end up with is a little less glue surface. You know? Uh, it'll work. I think when I built the prototype, I sanded both of them too. And then I came back and went, oh, you know what? <laughs> that might not work out so good. <coughs> That's a great one. Didn't it? I I think we surprised how close he was. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. About a dozen or so strokes back and forth has gotten me at a pretty good bevel. And yeah, maybe a little more. I definitely want to make sure everybody gets plenty. Yes. You might want to leave them with slicing. That way that you, you don't have to worry about talking back and forth. Yeah. You have a question? We got a question? No, I found the big windows. Okay. But I don't have any out You don't have any out Oh, and one of the little one of the little ledges popped out. Yeah. Let me look. We've got. I had one extra kit over here. <coughs> somebody was missing a part, and somebody broke a part, and we kind of been swiping extras out of it. So let me look and see if I yeah, still I have those. Yeah, <laughs> you know, actually, I meant to talk to y'all about doing open windows if you wanted to. That's one of the advantages of doing these kits like we like we're doing is that if you wanted to have a window open, you can. The trick is, is you've got to cut the glass and add it back in behind. Uh, but it can be done, so. You're not seeing this. Seeing what? <laughs> Seeing what? Yeah, exactly. Gave away my extra piece. What do you? I'll oh, forget her. Roll it. Okay. okay. Yeah, there's plenty of change in there. Any part of this map? Not right. Yes. Yeah. That's what he called the wrong for change. <laughs> do I? Sorry. You need part of that back? Um, I might. Because I only need the thing in the center. I just, I may need the uh, little desk thing for it. All came out, but yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, you want these two? Hmm? Nah, nah, you're okay. fine. In the set on your your deal here, marked bay window, there is a little piece out here on the end of the windows that's just a flat with a couple of angles on it. I gave you that as a leftover from the interior set uh, to kind of help you get the uh, shape for the bay window down. It's actually the desk for the dispatcher. So if you want to use that as a add-in, you get a black surface behind here, besides my shirt. Um, it's on the sheet marked bay window. It's this little piece right here. 
That's actually meant to ask, act as a desk for the uh, oh, for the operator. I'm trying to fit with that one. Yeah, and that'll actually kind of help you shape your uh, bay window. your bay window. Also, all of these little pieces left over on these sheets. I mean, you kind of think of it as an old plastic kit. You had all the sprues right. left over. Well, on these carrier sheets like this, save these things because, like the pop-outs on the windows, yeah. that's a perfect 90-degree corner. So if you're not putting an interior in them, use it as corner bracing. It'll help keep your, your corners square. Um, underneath the desk, for example, I didn't, I didn't give you all the parts and pieces for the interior, um, but when I built the prototype on mine, I literally just took a couple pieces of strip wood and stacked them up here underneath, and away we went. Do I need to get you something, sir? No. Oh, okay. Watching. Oh, okay. I'm watching sure. you. All right. <laughs> so basically all I'm doing with this, once I get it all, all uh, sanded down and ready to go, I'm going to pull back in here with my uh, shot glass and my glue. And I'm going to add a little bit of glue. I like to work from the center of the window out. So just like gluing the walls together, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to scrape a little bit of glue onto the edge of it. And if it looks like I got a lot on here, it's because I do. And I do that on purpose. Because right now what I've got is going to be, I think, a lot of squeeze out. Like I, like I mentioned before, I take my thumb and my forefinger, I lay it in here. It's kind of hard to see it, but it's, it's down about halfway down my finger. So there's a little bit of overlap there. And then what I do with it, let's see if I can turn it, there we go. So you kind of see how my, I've got it in here? I'll take my thumb and my forefinger and then I'll just pull the part out. Never push it, pull it out. What that'll do is that'll take any of the extra and it rubs it out on my thumb and my finger and leaves me just a nice little fine bead of glue right there on the surface. And your finger and your thumb protect that from rocking down onto the painted surface. And it gives you a really nice little bead of glue and should keep you from having too much squeeze out. So I'm gonna take these two parts now and I'm gonna glue them together. You'll note I'm not worried too much about the angle at this point. I'm just trying to get them glued together with whatever angle my sanding gave me. If you end up with a little bit of a gap somewhere, that's not this the end of the world. You can always take it back apart and clean it up a little bit if you need to. Also remember, we've got the rest of that bay window card has trim on it. And the reason they put trim on things is to hide the gaps. So just like building a real one, that's exactly what we're gonna do with this one. Now once I have the center and one wing on, I'm gonna take the desk piece and I'm gonna go ahead and glue it in because that'll help me set that angle. And I glue it in, not necessarily flush with the bottom of the window, but a little bit below it. And you can eyeball that however you want to do it. I just kind of look it over. I'm going to come back in. I'm going to do the exact same process. I put my pin in the glue. I spin it around to get me a, a blob of glue on there. I'm going to come back. I'm going to put it along the edge. It's going to look like it is way too much glue. And then I'm going to clean it down with my thumb and my forefinger. The idea is to make sure you have plenty of glue on there without having too much. Because having too much creates squeeze out, which then you have to clean up. Not having enough glue on it creates a problem later with a starved glue joint and then your building wanting to come apart. And that's never a good thing. So now, let me get my pad over here so it shows up a little better on camera. Sorry about that, Mr. Cranda. I'm gonna come in here and I'll say, I'm just gonna eyeball it. I'm gonna come in below the window. I'm going to glue it in there and hold it together for a little bit. I'm sure if he put his coffee cup on here, it might want to slide across the desk because I'm not making perfectly sure that it's uh, level or anything, but at this point, I don't really, I'm not really worried about that. And I'm going to let that set up for a couple seconds, and then uh, I'll come back in and we'll, there we go, and we'll glue it up. Now I'm going to take some of the materials, and if anybody wants some, let me know. When I cut out all y'all's kits, it ends up with a lot of extra scrap left over, and I just threw this in a bag. So if somebody would like a couple pieces for putting in as bracing like I was just talking about, come on up and feel free to take some home. Uh, a lot of it's plywood, so it doesn't cut as easily as, some, you know, as a regular, just a solid piece of basswood will, but uh, it will get you through. In fact, I've even got a few extra... Um, freight door and door backs and a few extra eave brackets here too looks like they got stuck in that bag 
which if we don't need those, I'll throw those in that bag right there and replace them because I swiped a set earlier. Use that as a brace. So see like a little piece like this one, this one here has got uh, just an odd shape to it. It was a leftover on a sheet and it's just not big enough for me to worry about saving to try to cut a, a replacement part in. Uh, for those of you who've never seen a laser work, and that may be something I need to film at some point and bring it up yep. here and we'll show it. Yep. Um, it's, a, it's a really neat deal. It looks like if anybody was ever in a computer room back in the day, it looks like the old green bar printers, about that same size. And when you load a piece of material into it, it's, it's a 12 by 24 cut bit. So you lay the material in it and there's a, 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 a focusing aspect you have to do. And uh, you hit this button on it and the, and the laser head travels over to one end of the machine and you've got this little plastic peg and you set that in there on top of the material and there's a notch on it. And you line that notch up with the bottom of the cutter head so you raise and lower the cut bed so that it is a consistent height. And that height's about two, two and a quarter inches maybe off the top of the workpiece. So the problem I have is that if I have a little piece like this, it's really not big enough for me to focus the laser again. And I could only probably get maybe a door back <coughs> or something like that out of it. Of course, this is actually thicker than I normally cut those out of. So basically stuff like this ends up in my trash can most of the time. But for stuff like this where we need some corner braces and things, these work out pretty slick. So all I do with a lot of this is I'll either put it in a miter box, which I didn't bring, and I cut it with a saw. Uh, sometimes if it's a real thin one like this one, I'll literally just break it off. If I need a reinforcement strip somewhere, uh, little pieces like this work out really well. Uh, but you'd be, you'd be surprised what you can do with some of this stuff. And like I say, I got a big bag full of it. So if anybody wants some, feel free to come up and grab you a piece or two. There's a uh, guy on the, inter on the internet or YouTube. It's foreign and he cuts out pieces of build buildings for what their fifth scale mm -hmm. military models. He makes dioramas. Yep. And he shows him cutting all that stuff out on his laser. Yeah. And then putting it together. Fantastic. Yes, I'll tell you what, man, if you ever think we, uh, we've we got the corner on uh, how to weather a model, all you got to do is go out and look at some of the military guys and oh, realize yeah. we don't do squat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's fun when you start looking at HO scale or N scale. You want it to look muddy? Hit it with a little weathering powder. Hit it with a little airbrush and put some paint on it, and that's it. And it will look muddy. You get into O, it probably better have a little bit of texture. You get into G or you get into the military stuff in 135th, it better have a lot of 3D, and it better look like mud, you know. I mean, a lot of guys are finding out that as they move up in scales, as they get older and they can't see HO anymore and they move up to O scale, which happens to a lot of people. It happens to a lot of us, you know. Uh, but what, what a lot of them are finding is there's a lot more detail required in O scale because now you can see it where you couldn't before. And uh, But that's also an advantage for those of us who really like to detail something. You get into S or O, it's the, the amount of stuff you can stick onto a model is just incredible. So, all right, for some reason, some of the guys have overhang and some of them don't. I'm not real sure how that happens considering it was all cut with the exact same drawings. Now see, I don't have any overhang on mine at all. That's really weird. Okay, some of the guys are finding that that desk piece, by the time you glue it up, overhangs when you get ready to put this next one on there just a little bit. If that's the case, you're gonna need to sand that bevel back just a little bit till you can flush it up. That's strange. Yeah, it's cut with the exact same drawing. Well, and remember how we had another one that was flipped? I know how the flip happened because okay. it's an odd shape, so you, you flip it and nest it. So like, it. if you look at yours, yours is flipped around from the prototype. Oh, uh, okay. So, but like it matters. Yeah, exactly. Now, um, we talked to last month about building, putting the walls together of your structure, and uh, I'll show you a little something here. I know this is flat because I've had it on a piece of glass at the house, but here on this table it rocks, okay? So you always wanna make sure that whatever you're setting and you're doing your assembly on is pretty dead flat if possible. Now, if you build this, oh, I'm sorry, I got it right in your way. If you build this with A-leans, it's flexible. And you can take that building then and you can twist it just a little bit and you can kind of tune it till it sets flat. If you built it with carpenter's glue, there is no twisting, there is no tweaking, you get to sand it now. And when you do that, get you a piece of glass or a piece of acrylic that is dead flat and take you some spray adhesive and spray down about a 220 piece of sandpaper so that the sand sides up, of course. <laughs> set it on your building, or set, set your building on top of it and 
move it in small circles like this. Put, try to put equal pressure on all four corners, but rub it in a circle like this, and that will sand the bottom of that building dead flat. If you get up here like this and you start doing it back and forth, you're only going to make it worse, and then the building's going to lean. Always go in small little orbits, and that will get it all nice and flat. But if you built it with A-Leans, you can do a little bit of a tweak to it. Now, you might pop a corner loose every once in a while if you get real dramatic with it. But you can give it just a little bit of a twist, and you can kind of tune it back flat. And if the corner pops out, just glue it back. And if the corner pops out, you glue it back. All right, so I'm going to glue up my other side of my bay window here. Normally when I cut a kit, I'm cutting them on demand. So I'm not cutting, you know, 40 or 50 of them at a time and setting them on a shelf and waiting for an order. I basically wait for an order to come in and then I cut it. And batching them out for production like we did with this one has introduced a couple of things that normally don't pop up when I'm cutting just one at a time. And I may have to just bite the bullet when it comes to production cuts and I'll start doing a lot of them and just continue to cut them in small batches instead of instead of trying to organize them so they can cut all the way across a sheet or something. It's just introducing too many little weird anomalies. <coughs> all right, so what I did when I went to glue this together, I don't know if you saw or not, I had the small, the small piece left to add on laying flat on my work surface. I put my glue on it, I put the glue on the desk, and then I'm holding on to it to keep it from slipping. I then tipped this up. Once I got it lined up, I tipped it up in place, and then I'll hold on to it for a little bit and let that set up. And then what you should end up with then is a bay window. And I just found another boo-boo. The desk doesn't want to fit into the window now, no, into the opening. Hmm. Yeah, it doesn't go through the opening. Yeah, I just saw that. Take it back out. Yeah, we're just going to pop the desk back out. It's too big. Put it in. Yeah. Yep. Blaine, in, in the inside of these walls, is there a frame on these windows? Is there a window frame? Yes. So what, in it? Inside? Yes. yes. So we should not put the desk right up at the bottom of the opening because you're going to have a frame there. Well, you don't have an interior frame. If you're if for a real one, you will because you have an interior. Right. Uh, so yeah, keep it keep it lower. Okay. Test fit to find out where your frame comes in, and then cut it off. Yeah, put it down there because it's got to be. Okay. So what I ended up just doing is I ended up taking my desk back out. Yeah, but then you don't have you're going to have to cut it this way, right? Where it turns into that little short piece. Just cut straight across. Yeah, if, if you want to trim that up, if you look at the piece right there, it's, you've got the angle and then it turns back and, and makes a 90 degree back there in the back. If you just cut that 90 degree section off, so if you put a straight edge across it and cut this little extra wing up here off, it'll fit. But once this thing goes together, it'll give you something that looks like that. Exact same drawing fits on the prototype and then it's on this. Yep, and then it got replicated 50 times. That's when cut and paste is not your friend. Yeah. <coughs> well, can you it back Part of the fun of putting these things together? <laughs> no. No, because it won't fit through the other one. So all I have to do is I have to cut that section right there off and get to fit. So in fact, I want to work on that right now. As a matter of fact, there it is. So I say I had a straight edge. Still do. Okay, I don't want to stop it for that because I'm trying to chew through plywood. That's 
straight. And if the open gets here to here, okay. You got it all to get an angle like that. By the way, if uh, anybody goes and buys an X-Acto knife that looks like this one, or thinks about buying one that looks like this one, it's a nice little ergonomic handle, and it is really, really comfortable. However, the outside of this thing is kind of a rubber, and eventually it starts getting greasy and slick, is the only way to describe it. And uh, I wanted to warn you all about that because I bought one and I really, really liked the way it fit in my hand. Thought about buying another one and I just kind of kept putting it off and putting it off. And then this thing started kind of getting greasy. So just kind of fair warning. I don't know if it's a combination of the oils in your hands and stuff and it's, it's seeping into the, the rubber on it or if the rubber is breaking down or quite what the deal is. Now I'm trimming my edge of my desk off. <laughs> I'm holding down a lot of downward pressure with a straight edge and I'm just making light pass after light pass with a sharp knife and it pops right off. So now I can come back in here and I should be able to glue it back in place. Yep, looks like I got to fit just right. Let's get some fresh glue. Now I will show you this. Aileen sells a super tacky and this stuff's really cool because it's designed to stand upside down so when you pull it out the pull the top off of it, the glue's already at the bottom you can just squeeze it and go the bigger bottles of Aileen's are designed to stand the other way around and then you're shaking the bottle like crazy so I actually have a small glass bowl sitting on my desk at the house I have no idea what its original purpose was my wife came in and said, can you use this for something? And I snatched it, turned around, and set my glue bottle in it so it rests more or less upside down. So if you can find something to do that with, if you're using the Aileen's, that's a real handy thing to have. Uh, it's not tall enough, it'll tip over because it's got quite a bit of weight. Where'd you find the other one? This one? Uh, Hobby Lobby. I don't know if they carry that one at Walmart with the other... Uh, the other Aileen's or not. They also sell a clear. Uh, I found I don't like the clear. It's not because it doesn't work as well or it doesn't hold or anything of the sort. It works just fine. The problem is I work on the bottom of a clear shot glass. Good luck finding clear glue on a clear glass bottle, on a clear glass base. You can do it either way. I, tend, I typically like to put my bay, the windows themselves into the bay window before I attach it to the depot, but you can put them in afterwards. It's, it's not going to kill it. It's just you have better access to it before you put them in. If you need to reach up behind it for anything. And if you've installed your windows in the rest of the depot and you've gone in and put those window sills in and things like that, you've probably already found that uh, you got to kind of guide them in with your thumbnail a little bit to get them in the right depth. And let's see if that's going to fit now. And the answer is still no, but we're close. Okay. Well, let's pop it back out. And let's trim a little bit off of here. Now I found that just now that it's still not quite wanting to fit. So I'm using the lines on my green cutting mat to line it up. And I'm just going to eyeball it and nibble a little corner off each edge and we'll see if we can't trim it up to get it to work and like I say we're not putting an interior in this so I don't know how much of this is going to show when it's all said and done but you can always come back in and black out paper it or uh, frost the windows over and put a dull light in there All right. Third time's charm. Take a little 
the problem. Yeah, great. I got another one to add. Common sense finally caught up with me and said, before you glue it back in again, actually see if it'll fit through the opening. It's amazing. Cut that board four times, it's still too short. And you can go to Rockward, you can go to Woodcraft, and I guarantee you when you walk in that door and you ask them for one, you ask them for that board stretcher, they're always on back order. They never have one on the shelf. They're so popular. I'm telling you. My first week working on a framing crew, I was basically just running parts back and forth. And one of the old, one of the older guys goes, "This, uh, this one's too short, kid. Need to go get a board stretcher." And I kind of ha ha ha, and I walked down there and grabbed the guy that was cutting the boards, and I said, "He says it's too short," and then he decided to be a smart aleck about it and ask for, tell me I need to take the board stretcher to it. He goes, here, kid, let me show you something. He walks over and cuts a scarf joint on this thing and slides up together, pins it back in yeah. place, and goes, now that, that one is, that was a one by six, now it's a you know, two by six, now it's a two by four, but it's also now longer. Okay, so once the desk fits, go ahead and attach that to the building? To the uh, the building I would recommend putting your windows in first. Okay. Just so you have better access to it, because once you've got it glued to the side, I mean, like I've got it set up here right now on the screen where I've got it kind of setting up against the building. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine trying to get your fingers in there and try to, you know, work that window into place without beating the banging? There you go. Yeah, I got ten thumbs and all of them left-handed. Yeah, you are left-handed. Actually, I'm what I call am by thumbbias. I'm all thumbs with both hands. I mean, you don't have your left-handed thing on the <laughs> Take the left-handed what's it? All right, now I just took a little bit of A-Lanes as well, and I just rolled a little blob up underneath the bottom of that desk and just kind of helped put a little bit of extra glue underneath where it's not going to be seen. Um, that'll just kind of help keep it supported a little bit better. Some of y'all have it where it looks like the prototype where the freight doors on the right hand side of the bay window and some of y'all have it where the freight doors on the left. And that all came down into nesting parts on the laser and, and cutting them. So it's basically the exact same process, the exact same building. It's just some folks have a left door and some folks have a right door. Which is not unusual for the prototype. Oh yeah, not at all. The one thing you'll find in railroads, if you start studying a prototype, you're going to find that each one of them has what they call a, a master a standards plan set. And what you'll find is they've got a what they call typically a class A depot, a class B, and a class C. And they get progressively larger as you go. And something like this would be a class A. And what they did is they paid the architect to draw it once. And when you get out to whatever the little town is and they go to set up to build a class A depot and they get to look at it and they go, Actually, you know what? We don't need a freight. We don't need a bigger passenger area because we're never going to catch passengers off of this thing. So if we've got a smaller waiting room, we move the office in a little bit. What we need is more freight space. So they'll condense the office, condense the passenger in, and they'll make the freight in bigger. Or they'll get to look at it and they'll go, okay, typically because of the way traffic's moving, we need the door on that end as opposed to that end. So they just build it in reverse. Uh, you'll see stuff moved around on them all the time. Uh, I really found a, a good example of this. If anybody have ever followed the B&O Railroad, uh, my business partner with the laser grew up in Cumberland, Maryland. So he's a big B&O guy. And uh, 
so we got to looking through their standards plans and we started drawing all these little yard towers, all these interlocking towers. And they're really cool little buildings. And what we found is, is that while they had one master set of drawings, no two of those towers were identical. Everything was different. One of them would have two windows on this side, some would have three. One would have two windows and one of them they boarded up and then hung an air conditioner in. Uh, the door would move to one side or the other or it would be centered. Uh, the stairs would wrap around the building or they would come out, go down a flight, turn and come down the rest of the way. Uh, it was such a big difference that by the time it was all said and done, when we finally designed the kit, we made the whole thing modular so that you could arrange the windows so you could have whichever set of windows you wanted facing your yard tracks whichever way you wanted, and use enough stair material in there that you could build the stairs about a dozen different ways, and probably have a lot left over extra. But the whole idea was is that way if you're trying to match any one particular building on there, you could probably do it with the parts we gave you. Um, and when it comes to shoring these things up, let's, let's zoom in on this a little bit more for David. This was the very original prototype, and you can see on this one, and I can even pass this around if you all want to take a look at it. Uh, I've made some changes to the trim, and you'll see I've really stuck some big beefy supports in here. Uh, even though this is 16th inch plywood, it was still warping pretty bad. And because it's a prototype, I really didn't want it going anywhere. And literally, it's still actually in good enough shape. I may go ahead and put some doors and windows in this and put a roof on it and stick it out on the railroad somewhere back in the back. Um, but as long as you're not putting an interior in it, you really don't care where your braces go, how big they are, as long as you can't see them through the windows, right? So when I actually made this version of it, the difference here is, is there is no bracing in it at all. The only thing holding it together are the internal walls are actually keep them, keeping them spaced apart. And I had to be real, real careful as I painted it to make sure that you put the, you know, put some weight on it, let it dry, and um, make sure everything stays good and flat. And that's again, anytime you're getting this thing wet, do that as much as you can while the walls are still flat. We call it building in the flat, basically. That way, every time you get it wet, you can put some weight on it and let it dry. Because otherwise, like here later, if you wanted to do some uh, alcohol and stain, you know, type weathering with something like this, you can do it. Just be real, real careful and don't get it overly wet because if it starts to warp now, getting it straight again means you're putting a lot of extra bracing in it. The internal bracing on this one, you'll note, is just four pretty good sized pieces and quite honestly, it was stuff I had laying around that I typically don't use anything that's that big, so I just grabbed it and went with it. Uh, but a lot of times I'll use a lot of those coffee stirring sticks like I handed out before and I glue them in a T-shape. And We talked about this the other day, but if you glue it in a T-shape, if it wants to warp, it now has to fight grain that's going in two different directions to let it, you know, to make that warp take effect. So if you glue that T brace together basically and then glue that flat the top of the T basically to take that and then put it against the wall, now you've got a really strong brace in there and it doesn't take a real thick piece of material then to get a really stout joint. We'll let you work on the bay windows for a little bit and then we're going to move on to roofing and cover a little bit of that before we uh, call it. And there's a little bit to cover there. The roofing will go pretty quick, but there will be a couple of things that we're not going to get to today and I want to make sure you know how to do them once, once you get home so you can finish it up. So now that we've got our bay windows either done, partially done, or at least you know how to take it home and finish it, let's talk about the roof. The roof is in two pieces. And basically you've got one side with a bunch of lines engraved on it. That is to help you try to keep your rows of shingles straight. Because trust me, you will get them off. It will happen. Don't feel bad. We do it all the time. The first thing I recommend you do is make it black in color. Because when you do a roof, the first thing they do is they lay down a layer of car paper. This helps seal the, you know, from leaks and things like that. But in our case, we don't need an extra layer of thickness out there making it look a little too thick. But we do want this to be a dark color so that if you do see through the gaps in the shingles, you don't see a wood color underneath it, right? So what I do is I take a Sharpie or a marks -a -lot or something like that, and I color the entire roof. And that just gives it a good black background to work from. And it makes your lines a little harder to see, I will grant, but it, it will work. So the first thing you want to do is you're going to take a uh, bit of this double face tape 
and it, there's a big old long lead off on the front of it so you'll have to kind of pull on it a little bit and get it to where you're down to where what's behind it is sticky and it is very sticky and when you start lifting it up what you're going to find is the piece on the outside unlike piece of scotch tape where the glue's on the inside right. now the glue's on the outside and you've got a, this brown piece of paper then is the protective layer between the two so what i have found is i hook it on my pinky i will take this then and i'll start out here on this one edge and i will roll it up here and i'll try to get it as close as i can you're going to get your hands sticky with glue you can't help awesome, us awesome. so it's kind of one of those just get happy with it i'll roll this thing yeah, out no, it's fine. i'll pull it uh, just a I'm little a, bit taut right now and get clinic. it lined up so and then i glue it down and i'm pressing it in place kind of burnishing it in with my fingertip okay. and then i'll come back over okay. here with an exacto or okay. even better my scalpel okay. if i can find it here it is and i'm going to cut this <coughs> well flip it over and then I'm going to trim it flush with the edge of the roof. Did you line that up with the line on that board? I didn't because this, this is just the glue edge, so I wasn't real worried about it. Now, the overrun piece that you get off of there, I take it and then I put it back around the edge of the tape so that you don't have it out there sticky and grabbing a hold of everything, including you, and then wanting to follow your hand back across the modeling table somewhere and breaking something. So now you've got this kind of burnished on. And I've already got some shingles on this. If you zoom in real close, you can see. And I've been playing around with some colors and things. And I found something on this that you're gonna to wanna to do before we start putting any shingles down. Take the same Sharpie, and if you've ever seen a shingle, okay, it's, it's about three feet long, each tab's about a foot, and vertically, you've got colored granules on what's going to be exposed about halfway up. There's a line of tar to help seal the row atop it, and then above it is black granules, okay? Take the Sharpie and color the upper half of each row black. Or take your alcohol and India ink stain and stain all your rows of shingles before you put them down. Because what I found in this was when I went back in and hand painted these first few rows in brown, in between the shingles, when you get it looking at it, you can see a little bit of gray in there from, from time to time. And what I ended up doing was getting some uh, hunter line stain in a kind of a dark brown color. And I went back in and just, I hit the worst of them and it actually adds a little bit of weathering to it and makes it look a lot better, I have to admit. It looks a lot better. The upper, I did about, the, I did, I did one width of tape that way. I put them on just straight, and then I hand painted them with some brown paint. And then I put on another width row, and I stained the first few of them after I put them on, and decided, no, nah, I'm going to stain them first, and then glue them down. And it works either way. You can take your pick on how you want to do that. The, but the, again, the trick is, you're going to want to color at least the upper half of each row because you're going to be able to see through to it. And black would ultimately be better. You can do it with a, mar with a marker pretty quick. You don't have to be perfect about it. The alignment's not necessarily, you know, earth-shatteringly perfect. Now, well, if, you, if you use the Indian ink, wouldn't that kind of seep into all the little cracks real easily? Yep, works pretty well. All right, you have to pardon the glare. I'm putting on the Optivisor here. Getting the uh, backing paper off of this is uh, the most difficult part of this process. I typically tip it up, I put my eyes on, and then I'm working on it with the edge of the blade here to see if I can slide it between the glue and the paper and see if I can get this to peel up. It is a royal pain, but trust me, when we, get ready, when we start getting ready to put the shingles down, it will pay huge dividends. And I will tell you this, I've, I've walked away from a model before and didn't have all the glue covered up and it seemed to stay active pretty well, but I really would recommend if possible, plan on, on uh, a session. If, you, if you've got a few minutes to work on one, try to do as many rows as you can that will fill up a line of this tape just so you don't have something sticky because 
inevitably, when you go to do that, you'll be sitting there watching TV or something, and you're going to raise your hand up, and your roof's going to be stuck to your hand because you've got it in that glue. Um, so it's better to do it just a little bit at a time. Wayne, there's a difference between the thickness of the first line on one side of the roof and on the other, which is the bottom. All right. uh, take your pick. Uh, okay. Typically, I put the two close lines up at the top. The smaller lines? Yeah, the smaller lines, I put those at the top. Um, not for any real particular reason. There, this isn't one of those, well, by general construction guidelines, it's, it, it's just kind of the way I drew it. And so I typically put those up at the top. Mainly because as I'm getting up there, I want that extra reference line a little bit closer. Because once you get to about the oh about the third line from the top, is is really if you're not if you haven't corrected any mistakes because you've got one row that ran a little low on one side, if you haven't started correcting those by then, if you don't get it by that third line and really start trying to stack it, it's going to be really obvious when you make your correction. And that gives me an extra line or two up there at the top is really. If you really want to get down to why did you do it, come up with a reason, that's the first thing I could pull out of thin air. Um, these, uh, these shingle rows in the paper, this is only newsprint, so it comes off real easy. I literally just grab a row and I just kind of pull on it to break it from the other side. And I'll get one or two of them out. Now, for what we're doing right now, I'm going to do it with a Sharpie just for sake of speed. And I don't have to wait, worry about the stain drying. But you can come back in later and stain it. I've done that and it works out pretty well. But we'll do a few with a Sharpie here and, and let you see how this one works. Literally all I'm going to do is come in here, turn it kind of sideways to get the wider flat part of the, uh, the marker on it. And I'm just going to color it from the top of the line to the edge. And again, we're not talking perfect. There's no points for coloring inside the lines. We're just trying to get some color on it so you don't miss it or you don't see the gray through the next layer. And you could conceivably do this even after you've glued it down now that I think about it, but I'd really recommend doing it first just to have it out of the way. And I'm going to do enough to do a couple of rows here. And what I've found with this is one, two, three, four, five, six. About six rows will take up a, a single row of, of tape. Now when you put shingles down on a real roof, the very first thing you do is you put on one row upside down. And then you lay, your, you lay your roof on it. You always start at the bottom and you work your way up because half of the row is going to be covered up by the next row above it. You overlap them. This keeps your roof from leaking. So you do that on the model too? I don't do the extra row on the bottom on a model, mainly because it creates, depending on how thick your shingle material is, on a real roof it creates just a little bit of a bump at the very bottom. On a model it creates a really big hump and by the time you scale it out now it's you know like this too thick. Uh, I don't because we're not trying to keep it watertight. All right. So another reason why I color the roof black and just kind of go that way with it. You also offset the tabs? I uh, always offset the tabs, you bet. And that, uh, that's something that as a judge, I look for. Uh, on shake roofs or uh, three tab shingles, either one, I'll look for the tabs being offset because if I start finding your model where the tabs are lining up, I'll ding you for it because that would leak. And the whole idea is, and part of that judging is, if you built it this way, would it work? And in that point, if your tabs are lining up, if you built it this way, it will leak. So again, your tab rows, we zoom in here pretty tight. Mm -hmm. um, your tab rows are long enough that you should have about two tabs on either side of the, of the roof. So you've got plenty of material to work with here. Now what I will tell you is once it lands in that tape, it is almost there for the duration and getting it back off again is tricky. So what I try to do is I'll put it into my hand, um, kind of like this. And I keep the extra up here off the back side of my hand. Can you zoom out just a bit? There we go. So if you can see like here, I've got the extra part of the row up here between my finger and I've got my finger and my thumb and I've got it resting here. I'm going to come in. I'm going to make sure that my tabs are offset, that I'm coming down just to the top of the row in front of it, which if you're putting your bottom row on, you don't have to worry about it. You can just put it on however you want to. And then I press it into place on this end. And then I come down a little bit further pull it tight 
I'll come in the middle and I'll press it down a little bit. I'll come a little bit over further, checking my alignment all the way, press it down again, and then come out here to the edge. Now once I've done that, I use, again, negative tweezers. I use these things for almost everything. I got this one in particular, it's got a little bit of a hook on it. I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna use that to kind of burnish it down, mainly because I can keep it nice and thin and on the paper and not over on the glue. And if I use my finger, my big old fat finger is gonna end up in that glue every time. And all I'm doing is I'm pressing the blackened half of that row down into that tape. Now, if you catch a shingle and it lifts, you're gonna to have to push it back down and there's no glue to hold it in place at this point because it's laying on top of the other row, right? So if you've got it and you don't like that look or it's sticking up too much or whatever, get a little bit of aliens on the end of a head pin, slide it up underneath, put just a little bit underneath there and push it back down again and let it, let it tack up and, and uh, glue itself back down. But personally, the uneven edge a little bit kind of has a cool look to it, so I don't worry about it too much. So when you get ready to do the next row, I'm literally doing the exact same process. I'm getting it up here. I'm holding it between my, uh, my two fingers and my thumb. I'm gonna get up on this edge, put my eyes back down where I can see. I'm gonna offset my tabs. Press it in place. Come down a little ways. Press that in place. Come down to the end. I'm looking down the end too as well to see if I'm keeping straight with my lines. And something you can do, if you have a hard time seeing the line after you've colored it with a Sharpie, come back in with a pencil, get it nice and sharp, and run a couple of passes down the, each of the scribe lines with a pencil on top of that Sharpie, because that graphite will shine a little bit and help you see it a little easier. Uh, also, you can get a, um, now I've talked about uh, weathering with these pencils. They make a white pencil, and it shows up on that black Sharpie fairly well. Um, you, well, I don't have one in this set, probably the other one. Uh, but you can get a white one or a silver one and get it good and sharp and then come along each edge of that and color a line back in and it'll help you register basically your reference down if you need it. Uh, but again, as I'm moving through that, I'm really watching to see because I, I did get a little off, especially in this second section right here when I was working on it last night because I got in a hurry cooking dinner and trying to do it at the same time. Gosh. And uh, got a little bit of a booger in it. But you know what? I guarantee it's smart. I like if I walk up on your roof that none of those are going to be straight either. Because Bob, Fred, and Julio, when they put that roof on, they weren't up there carefully measuring each one and tacking them down. They got up there and laid it in place, and away they went. Bam, bam, bam. Yep. Bam, bam, bam. Oh, it looks too good as bad. <laughs> Almost. That's always the trick, is, is how much character do you really want to give it, you know? But... It, uh, it is fun. It uh, also lets you uh, hide some mistakes that way. As George Shelios always says on his uh, layout tour videos he did for Great Model Railroads, fortunately future weathering hides most mistakes. He's not wrong. Good weathering job can hide a lot of sins. So I've got two more rows here. I'm gonna go ahead and, and prepare a couple more like I say, it's about six rows to eat through that half inch of paper there. So we're just going to go ahead and prep enough rows to get us going. And like I say, I cut them long enough so that each row should overlap your roof so you don't have a lot of staggering to worry about. Some kits or some suppliers, they're not really, they don't, they have a file for shingles. And they'll cut you that file and they'll cut you a boatload of extras and you've got situations where you're putting down partial rows. And you're, it's the exact same process. It's not rocket science. You know, there's no, nothing else extra that you have to do. You just have to be real careful to get each row to line up correctly when you start, you know, splitting them in half and things like that. Um, okay. So I'm going to go in now and color in. Well, I'll tell you what. Sharpie could make a fortune. I love these markers, but man, I wish they could figure out a way to make it smell less. These things reek. 
course now I'll get a man, it's cool. Of course now we'll get a hate comment from somebody working with Sharpie on our on our YouTube upload. I work for Sharpie. I think it's a little that. more and you won't care. That's right. <laughs> so can you use a, a Sharpie to color the shingles in too or just use You could. Um, if you get the right color that you want, you could. Um, I don't know if I'd want to do that, but I guess you could. You could color them with colored pencils too, for that matter. Because you don't get that root too wet, do you? Uh, preferably not. That's another reason why I like using this tape as well. Not only is it just really, really fast, it holds really well. It holds not just the paper shingles or cardboard shingles. Um, I do for contest modeling, if I'm putting down shakes, I put down wood shakes. They're cut out of uh, the wrappers for, uh, for really expensive cigars. They, make, uh, they, they wrap those with a cedar wrapper, mm -hmm. and I'll take those and I'll cut them. And I learned this from Gil Freitag down in Houston. Uh, you take them and you cut them into strips. So imagine, I don't know if you can see it on the screen up there. So imagine these are each individual strips of cedar. And you take them after you get them cut and you line them all up. And most of us are old enough to remember the days before PowerPoint and Excel and all that. And when you did a chart, you did it on a piece of poster board and you used chart tape to do the lines in the graph, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you can still buy that stuff. And what you do is you, you get the rows of <laughs> cedar lined up like this and then you take the chart tape and you start at the very bottom and you put a row of chart tape across them at a 90 degree angle, okay? Then you come up the width of a piece of chart, uh, chart tape and you leave that blank and you put down another row and then blank and another row and blank and another row until you get all the way across. And what you end up with is kind of like the flexible uh, top of a roll top desk, okay? And what you'll do then is you're going to take it, turn it back this way. You're going to take a pair of scissors and cut it so that you've got a piece of chart tape and a blank row on each piece you cut out. And what you then have is a row of individual hand cut shingles. So when you go to lay those down, you put your glue down on the bottom edge, you turn it so that the chart tape is down and you glue it down. Let that set, take the next row, put some glue down, chart tape, then that end goes down again over the blank edge, over the clear edge from the bottom row, line that up and you get that all the way to the top. Then you come back and you take the edge of that chart tape and you peel it up and it leaves you an entire roof of individual hand laid wooden shingles. It's not that much more time consuming than doing this and it is a much better look if you're doing a shake, shake shingle roof, of course. Three tab, very common, been around for decades. Find it on almost anything. It was real popular there for a while in the 50s and the 60s to even see them cut in shapes. Uh, the roof on, at the depot in Chama had diamond scale on it for a while. And uh, I've gotten those drawn up and, and can cut those. Uh, there's some that were scalloped that uh, look kind of cool depending on the shape of the building that you've got going on. But most modern roofs are three tab asphalt. They've got them now too, what they call them an architectural grade, where they've made them thicker, they've got some uh, uh, asymmetric tabs to them, and uh, they're really, really good. If the, uh, you get talking to a roofer about your roof on your house after you've had a good hailstorm, and he gives you, well, there's a couple of options. The really expensive one is using the shingles I'm talking about. Now, they're really, really good. They last forever. They're a little more hail resistant than the other, A, because they're thicker. But it gives you a more of that asymmetrical shake shingle type of uh, look to them. <laughs> yes, they do, by a lot. I mean, you go from a five-year to a... 10 year or sometimes 15 year. I got steel on my roof. And that's the best way to go right there. What's a ceramic on top? Steel roof. It's guaranteed for life. Oh, except for some major companies. Insurance companies are really playing games with steel roofs. Are they now? And you get a certificate from the company. Hell gets a dense they call it cosmetic. Yep. Because it is. And they don't, well, that's not true. The galvanized, you, when you dent a galvanized roof. That's true, you pop, you pop the You the pop the off. galvanized. Yep. What happens next? It rots. Yep. What happens after that? You have a hole. Leaks. <laughs> yep. But uh, like uh, Kenneth was just saying, a lot, of the, a lot of them now are coming guaranteed for life, so. Now mine's got a steel roof with the ceramic stuff on it, and it's guaranteed for life. 
Oh, ceramic, yeah, with ceramic adds in. But a lot of the steel roofs just are galvanized steel. Yeah, yeah, I know. But it's guaranteed for life, and they'll come back and replace the section. No cost if, you know, gets damaged or if the ceramic you know, comes off, just call them up. But you get a certificate from the company, major company, with your, everything on it, boy. It's not a, well, and, and that's good as long as the company stays in oh, business. Oh, yeah. It's one yeah. of the major yeah. ones. You know. But it's Whoops. there in there for long, forever. Yeah. Joe's Ruby. Joe's Ruby. Yeah, it's not Joe's Ruby. <laughs> and if you file a claim, then next week it becomes Joe Bob's Ruby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that ain't the why. <coughs> All those shingles? Mm -hmm. When do you paint them? Uh, usually once I've got everything done. I was thinking that you paint them, then you cover up the line. Yep. Well, I'm, I'm not going to paint anything. I mean, I did on this one just to see how well, because quite honestly, this this newsprint thing is a new deal for me. Mm -hmm. I've been looking for some paper materials to cut HO out of for a while. The O scale and the G scale are cut in a thicker artist paper, mm -hmm. and because I can get away with it. But in HO, it just looks a little thick, and I was really concerned that it uh, it really just didn't look right to me. And uh, so I started experimenting around with some stuff, and when I found the newsprint, decided to give it a rip because I had cut, I'd seen newsprint shingles in some of the older kits, and uh, you know sometimes old school well, is still the best way. What do you recommend? A alcohol stain? Or uh, I've done it both. Uh, in fact, I'll show you the piece here in a second. Uh, I've got one course or one set of courses that I did, and I painted them, and then I did another one where I stained them. And I'll give you a chance to take a look at either one of them and see. This isn't Yeah. Uh, that I wouldn't do. I would. I'd go ahead. And put, I'd paint them after the after the entire roof after the entire pitch is done. Then I'd come back in and paint them. I was thinking just taking one strip and paint. Yeah. Just taking your and putting it across. See how it works. Yeah, you could. You could. You just just remember you want to you you like anything else. It's if you're working with wood or a paper material, you want a dry brush. Oh yeah. I mean, almost anything you're doing, you're going to want a dry brush. And I will tell you this: doing the doing the black on uh, black on black like that makes it a little hard to see where to line it up. I won't get that. But see, the nice part is, is you don't have to wait for that glue to tack up or dry. You get the first row down, you can go right to the next row, and you're right on charging. Particular orientation on these things? Uh, the slots go down. No. Oh, those? Yes. Now we'll cover that here in a second too. Um, those are corbels. Yeah. Corbels. Yeah, or Eve brackets. I figured out which way to do the end. I don't know which way this one. Yeah, there is a bit of an orientation to that. Looks like this side. The long. arch, the arch faces down. Well, I figured that, but this leg's longer than that leg. Oh, okay, so yeah. I didn't know which one to get going against the wall. Yeah, this would be. I guess if you put it on the wrong way, it screw up the roof. Yes, because then the angle's not going to be the same. Right. That's why I was asking. <laughs> yep. <coughs> Now, if you've got a roll of tape and you want more of it, again, you can get it on Amazon. Yeah, I'll probably use the whole roll of screws up so much. <laughs> like I say, it's really super sticky. It's a little bit of an adjustment period to get used to, but man, I'll tell you, once you've made that leap, you will never go back to trying to glue these things down. I mean, I've done one, two, three, four, five, six rows of shingles in a matter of about two minutes. I would have done one, maybe two, in that same time frame and still be waiting for glue to dry.
Do you want us to bring these things back next month, please? That would be the idea. Okay. I'd really love to see you bring them to the convention completed and stick them in the contest. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make the convention. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, health, I think traveling is out of the question these days. We probably should have started a lot earlier. Yeah. You'll be happy to know. But we'll get it done. Oh, yeah. All right. I'll walk this around, show you guys what I've come up with. Um, oh, <coughs> your overhang. Once you've, done a, once you've done a few rows, I go ahead and trim the overhang off. And I really like to do it with chisel blade, uh, just because I can kind of guillotine straight down onto it. You could do it with another with another one. I just really try to avoid dragging a knife across there because it tends to want to grab the row of shingles and start kind of yanking things loose. So I like to take a really wide blade, not one of the smaller exactos, but one of the big fat ones. And I'm finding that the older I get, the more I like a bigger handle to hold on to. Uh, but I'll come in and I'll line the flat part because if you've ever messed with one of these, one side of the, flat, the blade is flat and then it's got a bevel on one end. I put the flat side up against the roof up on a tip and then I rock it down and just kind of guillotine it down through there and give it a little bit of a press and then pick it up, move over and come back down again and it cuts them all off nice and flush and makes life easier and then I know I'm not going to run the risk of grabbing it and yanking a few of them loose. So just applying a little pressure and it's done, eh? Yep. So what we've got now, I'll give you, you have an idea. The first row was painted, second row was stained, and these I did with the Sharpie and then I'll come back in and I'll paint off. This is uh, a old bottle of uh, polyscale DNRG building brown that I just painted on it after I put oh, yeah, this, yeah. this many rows on. I came back and painted it. This one I stained. Yeah. I just yeah. did it with the paintbrush and the same kind of line. Did you do just one? And these ones I just put down after I painted it. I put two of them together with the last one. I just did it with the last one. And, and the idea is you're not trying to flood it when you stain it, you're just trying to put enough on there to cover, you know, to, to coat, give the shingles a good color coat. Yeah. So that's a stain. So this, so this is paint. Yeah. This one's stained. And this one I colored the back. Oh, yeah. Of Sharpie. And you can see if you look at them, like right there, the second row, the third row, there's a big white spot right there. And that's because I just colored it first. And that's the row underneath of your seat. So I did that. Okay, so like I colored mine. Can you put those little things on there? Okay. Mm -hmm. and then, and then, and then, I, I, I yeah, color it from the original. Right there, there, there and then separate the channel all the way off. It's got the railway special on it. Five hundred thousand year old painting or skating or whatnot. Yes. I mean, I'm doing it by the time. Well, not only that, but stop and think about it from a weathering perspective. The rain's going to hit and it runs straight down. So any brush strokes that you get. Either with the stain on. or with the paint, so now are vertical and it will look more natural. If you're painting them this way, even if you had it all glued down flat, everything's all nice and tight. And you're doing it this way, you get brush marks across here. Now your brain's looking at it. Was a strong. This deep was a lot of wind. Well, I found the signs for. There's a picture of the not the actual deep Somebody no, this is a bell telephone sign. It's normal about 1890. I've got some Ready to cut right here. Yeah, it's like a picture of a little slot right here. Okay. And I have a picture of a depot which has that exact thing in it. That I want on the end to have local Western Union. Western Union Telegraph. It's just you don't want to get the big thing. Western big. Union Telegraph one, which is the cupola, it's like it's right on the right side. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I had to make about eight different. I had to make eight different size copies because you know if you make one, you keep it a little smaller, so on a piece of paper, I made about five different. Sizes, and then I took it and I put it over. You're going to get to the top of it and go, okay, how do I put the top on? If you've never roofed a building before, here's how you do it. A th the tab itself or the shingle itself has three tabs on it. 
when we always roofed them, you come across where that tab is, there's a little, uh, runs up, rounds over, and comes back down again. That separates them into three, right? Mm -hmm. You complete that line all the way across the shingle. So what you end up with is three individual shingles instead of one tab of three, right? You turn it, you start on one end, and you take it and you hammer it down on one side of the roof, you fold it over the peak, and you put it down on the other side. So you need to have your shingle rows as tight to that top as you can get it on both sides, and when you glue the roof down onto the building, you want to make sure those are as close as you can get them, because you're going to overlap them with individual little shingles. Sorry, keep leaving stuff in the way. Um, Boy, the glare on that is amazing, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I got sunglasses on. Yeah, you'd better. Uh, so what you're going to do then is you're going to have each one of those little tabs, you're going to cut them through, fold it over, and glue it down. Now, I pre-fold these, okay? I'll take the back side of my X-Acto knife, and I'll take that one little shingle, and I'll hold it my, between my thumb and my forefinger, and I'll wrap it and put just a little bit of a crease in it, so it'll hold a bit of an edge. And then I just take a little bit of Aileen's, drop it on the inside of that, because you know you got a V-shape like this. I put a little bit of Aileen's in it like this, turn it over, glue it down to the roof. And you're, what you're going to find in the first one, and you're not coloring any of these, so you're not doing the make half of it black or whatever. Just start on one end and go all the way to the other. When you get to the other end, you should have about a half a shingle overlap. Trim that one off and then paint the whole thing to match it. And that. Now you can do it that way if you're going to do a uh, traditional build. Uh, you will see buildings where they'll take a uh, piece of sheet metal and they'll actually fold that over and make a crown out of that. You can do that with uh, some real thin tin foil. This is again where I like the uh, aluminum foil from uh, uh, Dove Chocolates because it's very, very thin. Uh, I buy that as a bag and uh, gave that to the wife because you know she does all this stuff to take care of us. And it was like, oh, how sweet. And then I swipe all the wrappers when she's done. I put them over in my box. And then you take that on a piece of glass and rub it with your fingertips and it rubs all the wrinkles out and then you can cut that into strips and you can lay that on. It makes great flashing. If you've got a roof where you've got a peak going this way and a peak going this way, you've got a piece, some flashing down that valley, that stuff makes great flashing. Um, be you good can, around fireplaces too. It's right? good around fireplaces, it's good around air, uh, plumbing vents. Anything that sticks up out of your roof, they'll have a flashing it's ring of some sort right? around that thing. To keep it from leaking in. So you put it on the chimney too, then, right? Uh, yeah, I take it, and fold a piece up, and run it all the way around the edge of the chimney, and then shingle up to it. Uh, that's another one too. We've not put any type of shing any type of chimneys, uh, uh, exhaust pipes for pot-bellied stoves or anything yeah, like that on this. So be thinking about that as you're roofing it. That if you want to get one of those, and and if you've got a pot-bellied stove, a uh, one of those coffee stirring straws makes a really nice chimney pipe. Or you can go buy a stove jack uh, casting, whichever way you want to go about doing it. But the, the idea is to remember, it went down before the shingles went down, so it shouldn't look like it's sitting on top of the shingles. The shingles should look like they're around and on top of the your chimney piece, okay? Um, lastly, we have all those little eave brackets, and there's two types of them. There's one that has a 90 degree edge. Those go on the ends. So those will go out here, and I just quite literally, fellas, I eyeballed it. I went over and I picked um, a, a scribe line, a full scribe line to either side of the upper window, and I glued it in so that it's flush with the angle up here, and I glued it and I used the scribe line there in the wall as a straight guideline, okay? Then I went over to just inside the trim on either corner and glued another one down, so you've got four along there. Along the, on the other side is where you find the other bracket. And what you're going to find there, and it's a little hard to tell, but one wing is a wee bit longer than the other one. Well, the best way to tell which way it goes on is to lay it on the side of the roof and look at the way the angle does. If you mount it one way, the angle mounts the, matches the pitch of the roof. If you get it the other way around, it doesn't match. You don't want your roof coming down and then trying to duck out real quick, you know, come down and then go back out again. You want it to be one nice, smooth, transitional line like you can see there. So that when the roof lays on it, you get this kind of effect, okay? Those are spaced wherever you want to put them. Uh, the way the doors are lined up, irregardless of if your freight doors are on the left or on the right, they're across from each other. And no matter how you do it, there's no 
perfect spaced interval that will allow you to put them all the way across the building at the exact same spacing. It's not going to work. I didn't do the math on that one up front. The windows are not spaced in such a way that you can do it. It's just not going to happen. So I literally went through here and I kind of eyeballed it when I did the, this original here. And what I ended up doing was basically like I did with the circular window, I came to the first full scribe line on either side of the bay window. I did one just on this side of the door and then this one here that is now broken will get replaced, but it's out here on this outer edge. And it's actually on the trim itself. I actually notched the trim and put it inside of the trim edge. On the other side over here, like I say, it's on the first full scribe after that. I found one on the edge and then I picked this one here, mainly because it's more or less on center, but still gives me a vertical scribe to use as a reference mark. On the other side, since I don't have the bay window, I put them as directly across as I could, which worked out in just about every case, but I went ahead and stuck an extra one in here across from the bay window, kind of because I could. Um, I cut you guys plenty of extras, so if you really want to get crazy with it and put them every couple of feet or however you want to go about doing it, you can. It's up to you. The only one that's really hard set in stone are these four on the ends. You really need all four of them and you really need them spaced about where I've got them. Okay? Everything else is up to you. Uh, typically on these, I wait uh, until I have the roof glued on. And, and if you're, if you're going to make a removable roof like I did with the prototype here, I'll have the roof on and in place, and then I'll prop it up, and I'll glue these things down. That way I can push it up against the roof, and I know I've got a good stop. So I'll, I'll reach up here and hold the roof on with one hand, and I'll slide that bracket up there, and I'll get it lined up and kind of hold it in place and let it tack up. If you're gluing the roof down, glue the bracket to the roof too. That'll help it give it some extra support. And then you don't have them breaking off like I did this one over here. Also... Another little tip from your Uncle Dwayne. How many of you guys go tailgating or have been tailgating and, or go out on a big family picnic, go camping or whatever, and have played cornhole? Yeah. Just a big long board, little angle, big hole, you throw a bean bag through it, right? Academy Sports, bless their hearts, sell those bean bags in sets. That is the world's greatest way to clamp down a roof while it's drying because it is a bean bag about that big. It's flexible. It makes no difference what the pitch of your roof is. You get it lined up where you want, you hold it in place on one end and you set a bean bag on it. You hold it, make sure it doesn't slip, get it lined up on the other end, set another bean bag on it and away you go. Now a full set of those things is a little expensive so get together with your buddies and go buy a set and split it. Uh, in my case, because I'm typically, if I'm building and especially this time of year when we're getting down to contest time and I've got several projects going at once, I figured I'd need a whole set. I got really lucky. I went over there about March or maybe first part of April one year, and they had a set that was two different shades of pink for breast cancer awareness that was back in February, and they had them on clearance, so I got them for like half price. <laughs> but uh, I kept the whole box for myself, A, because I'm greedy, and B, because I work on more than one thing at once. Um, but. If you want to go that route, seriously, get together with a couple of buddies and go buy a set because those little bean bags are fantastic because they've got enough weight. They can hold that thing down, keep a nice tight joint, and give you just enough clamping pressure that your roof doesn't slip and slide around and you don't have to worry about, I mean, somebody's making a set now and they've got a set screw and you can adjust the angle to match the pitch of your roof and they're magnetic and all this kind of stuff and they're god awful expensive. And it's a neat idea. It's a lot of extra work, but it's kind of a neat idea. But for half of what one of those things would cost me, I could, I mean, for what two of those things will cost, you can buy a whole set of those cornhole bean bags. And you have enough for you and your buddies to do it too. Plus, you have an extra set of bean bags, cornhole bags. There you go. And I, had, I mentioned this in another clinic here a while back, and somebody told me that occasionally you can actually find them where they'll sell them one or two at a time as replacements for sets. If you, you know, split one open or whatever, you usually pitch it. So they'll sell them as replacements. And if you can find a set of replacements, great. If they sell them one or two at a time, you know, get enough to have at least two, uh, but four is better if you can. But I think they come, I think, six or eight to each person playing and... And then, so you've got, I think it's six, and then you've got six of each color. So you end up with 12 bags if you buy a set for yourself. So like I say, go to, go together with a buddy or two and split them. But well, go to Amazon, right? You probably, you probably find them on place. Amazon. Like I say, Academy Sports has them in stock. Uh, they keep them over there in their camping supplies and such. So uh, you 
can pretty much get them any any time. But yeah, I'm sure Amazon will get them if you get them on Prime. You can have them here in a couple of days with free shipping. So that pretty much wraps up the build. If you guys have any questions when you're working on this to finish it up, like I've said before, please feel free to reach out to me. I've had a couple of guys call and ask some questions or shoot me emails. Uh, if anything breaks or whatever, let me know, and I'll make sure we can get you some extras cut or whatever. Any questions? Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you.